When learning to sail, you're taught to passage plan well in advance. But what happens when something comes along to cock it all up? It could be a big weather change, it could be a lightning storm, it could be really nasty swells, or it could be an anchorage that turns out to be unprotected. Long-term route planning involves taking currents, seasons and prevailing winds into consideration. For our trip southwards along the Western Isles of Sumatra, we decided to choose the transitional period because there are fewer headwinds and the steep swell is not quite so steep. Yes, and in fact we know of two boats who left a couple of months after we did our trip and they were indeed battered by seasonal winds and waves. So we wanted a comfortable trip despite having to do a little bit more motoring than we anticipated. But on the local level, you don't always know what's around the corner. There could be a fast squall approaching, uh, maybe some of the anchorages that you'd originally marked as safe have suddenly become untenable. Perhaps the quickest route offers no anchorages at all. So how do you navigate on the hoof? But before we get to that, let's just ease you in with the beautiful desert islands with nothing on it but one hut and some seashells. It was a short hop this morning, about 10 miles or so south from uh, Tuapajet, the capital, and we're now anchored between two islands with reefs all the way round, and uh, we're kind of in the middle there, reefs either side of us, which is very exciting as always. Beautiful clear water, we've just gone over in the dinghy and could see the reef beneath us. On the far side of the islands, on the west side, are rollers coming in. It's obviously a surfing area because we've seen a big surfer's boat out there and they're all out on the waves doing their thing. I went for a little walk around this, around the side here, and there's a shack which you can see from the boat. And I thought I'd go to investigate, just to make sure there were no snakes. And uh, it's quite uh, unusual. And uh, it's like some kind of druid patron witch's place with things hanging up, warding off evil spirits. It's kind of cute. I think there was a bed inside it. Let's have a look. Come in through the garden at the front there, over the wall. And there's a little piece of artwork here with lots of beautiful things in it. And over here is a little collection of plastic. It looks like someone's been going around the beach and picking up plastic, putting it all together. I guess at some stage they'll take it off the island and they've used bits of glass and odd pots and things just hanging here from these all the way around uh, intermingled with beautiful shells kind of nice
Well, here we are on the west coast of Cipera. Cipera is the island that Tuapajet's on. And we are now on the west side. Now, previously we've been going down the east side. And uh, this time we're now on the west, which means we're a bit more exposed to that swell. And it's, um, I've seen worse. It's still quite significant, but of course the effect is that the whole of this western coastline is battered with surf. Now, as we left our previous anchorage, uh, there were a couple of uh, catamarans there with surfers and some some very good uh, surf, proper, I don't know what you call it, they had tubes anyway, they were proper curlers and uh, two boatloads of surfers having a lot of fun. Uh, behind me is a big uh, fishing boat, a typical large Indonesian boat. It still has that, those outriggers at the moment, it looks, uh, um, looks like a trimaran. Uh, with lots and lots of lights and brightly painted colours. So we're going to head down just to the bottom of Siparu. Uh, there's a little island there. Uh, we found a whole load of anchor marks actually in, uh, in between the island and the mainland which should give us some protection. And then it's a short hop down to the last main island and uh, after that it's out into the big wide yonder but that's not for a, you know a few days yet so we're just uh, unfortunately having to motor at the moment there is once again not much wind and what wind there is it's straight on the nose um, i just hope it's not like this for the rest of the journey we could do it a bit of wind on the beam or from behind us uh, because i don't really want to be motoring the next 500 miles still gives us a chance to make more bread make water charge up those batteries and um, yeah there we go that's our update so far oh one thing I wanted to talk about was this right hanging out the back of the boat you can just see in the water that is our water maker filter I was told about this trick years and years ago I think I've even tried it before now as well the idea being that the water maker filter that filters the raw water that comes in from the sea to make the fresh water it's a five micron filter and obviously it gets clogged up quite quickly so the suggestion was to throw it out the back on a piece of rope and give it a clean so i thought i'd try it now i don't think this works with every type of filter but this is one of those um, fibrous sort of string filters rather than the foam ones and i just thought i'd give it a go see how it cleans up Beautiful sunny day, there's no wind, we're motor sailing, so just to pass the time, chuck the line out as usual, and I thought I'd got something. In fact, it's in the shape of a fish. But once again, we're cleaning the ocean of plastic bags, one bag at a time, put it in the bin. Scrubber's got it. To mention. Straight down. We have introduced these Belfeng radios which American bought us some time ago. Because we have a new handheld VHF we thought we'd put these to use by using them for setting the anchor and it just makes communication with these a lot easier. I'm just going to let it settle first. Okay. Straightening up. Uh, my transits aren't moving. Yeah, it's pretty straight out now. Okay, I think that's good. Yeah, agreed. Okay, we have an interesting situation here. Uh, there's no wind. We have uh, about 500 miles to go to get to Jakarta, maybe a little bit more. 
At the moment we've got full tanks and we're carrying another 280 litres on deck. So in theory we should have enough fuel, but of course I don't like to run the tanks right down, I like to keep them topped up. So that's the first situation. We've got one more place we know that we can refuel at within the Mentawis, and then after that the next place would be on Sumatra mainland, which is a sort of diversion. Um, so we don't really want to do that. In an ideal world we should be sailing, but because there is no wind we're going to have to motor. So that's the situation. We're about to leave this, these sets of islands and go to the last set of islands where we can possibly get more fuel. That's approximately 50 miles away. So do we go down the west coast or do we go down the east coast? Well, at the moment, as you can see, there's a little bit of swell, but it's not too much. But that's because it's first thing in the morning. The swell picks up throughout the day. From what we can see on the west coast, there are a few bays, but they're kind of exposed to the swell. Of course the chart information doesn't give us much to go by so we're relying on satellite data and when you look at some of the satellite images you can see quite quick clearly swell coming into the bays which makes them look untenable of course it depends when that satellite image was taken as to which season it was in the alternative is to go down the east coast uh, get out the swell but the problem with that is there is clearly nowhere to anchor at all from what we can see it's a pretty straight coastline which would then make our journey to the capital of the next island approximately 40 odd miles. I'd like to go down the west coast, check out some of these places, but if they become untenable, then that adds another extra 10 miles to get to the capital, which makes it a 50 mile journey today. So what are your thoughts, Liz? Yes, well, there's also the question of timing in that uh, we need to be in Jakarta by the 24th because of visa restrictions. And so where people might be saying, well, why don't you just wait for some wind? We don't have that luxury. We've got two weeks, basically, to, uh, in fact, we've got less than two weeks. We need to be there by the 24th, what's today? Mm. Fifth, sixth? Yeah. From a practical point of view, we should probably go down that east coast and just get straight down to Sipacup, isn't it? Yeah, Sipacup. We've got another waypoint about two miles away. We kind of have to make a decision when we get to that waypoint, because after that we have to choose whether we go down the east coast or go down the west coast. My vote at the moment, let's just get to the nearest one, stop and have a little think. Um, it's got us six miles closer to Sikakap, which would mean that tomorrow, if we decide to go straight to Sikakap, we can do it easily in a day, in daylight. Mm. It's a possibility. I just don't know. I just don't know. I can't make a decision. I've had two cups of coffee. I was hoping I'd be ready to make a decision, but uh, yeah. There we go. Now it's another one of those twilight zone crossings. I wanted to clear the headland first. There's quite a bit of surf there. Uh, we had some wind coming, as you can see, and it looked like it was good enough to get the uh, Code Zero out. But as we've cleared that headland, two things have happened. You can see the wind is dancing all over the place, so we've got no wind. And our speed has dropped right down to less than three knots. We've got almost two knots of current against us, and you can see the angle at which we're having to steer against that current. Washing day today. Liz very kindly washed my quick dry tops and shorts using some water that we'd collected from the rain and we didn't get around to decanting it into the tanks uh, and it's been sitting in the cockpit so she's put that to good use and hopefully that will all dry before that turns up this is a repeat of what happened last time when we were jumping between islands the effect of the uh, currents against us followed by a nasty northwesterly squall and I think that's coming our way talking of washing Here's the filter that I put out the back of the boat on a piece of rope. Now it probably still looks very dirty to you, and it is really, but it's a lot cleaner than it was. So I think if you were stuck and you need to recycle your filters, then you might get another run's worth out of it. With this, I might pop that back in the water maker and see, uh, see how it is. This always messes with my head. Depth showing 12 meters, and earlier it was showing two meters. Well, in actual fact, this is a common issue with depth sounders. 
Uh, we're, we're quite lucky, our depth sounder can read up to around about 180 meters, but after that it drops off and uh, it loses the reading. And so what normally happens is when you're over 180 or so meters, it shows this, three dotted lines, and then occasionally you get this weird anomaly and it sort of starts showing odd spurious depths. It's like the depth sounder's playing games. It can't be bothered to give you the correct depth, so it says, I don't know what, I'll, I'll shit you up a bit. I'll throw up two and a half meters just to keep you on your toes. Meanwhile, that squall is getting closer. I'm kind of hoping it's going to go off in that direction. As you can see, despite the lack of wind, we have put out the staysail and the mizzen. Just there. And this really helps with the, the, the movement of the boat. Although there's not much wind, there's just enough to keep Esper moving rhythmically in that swell. It really helps. So I do recommend if, if you're in very light winds and you're having to motor, it's worth putting the sails out anyway because it just gives that extra bit of stability. It makes it slightly less rolly. That looks like a real bastard squall, that. Looks pretty from here, doesn't it? Well, this is the home run. We've got just another two, three miles to go down inside there. <laughs> and finally, the rain. I think it's gonna catch up with us. It seems to be coming this way. So we've battened down the hatches and uh, getting ready for a bit of a soaking. A nice welcome to Sipacat. like the evening commute fishermen going out and it also seems that for every mosque there's a church and for every church there's a mosque unity man We really are right in the centre of it. This is Sikakep and we are anchored literally 200 metres from the harbour wall. Lots of noise, lots of fishing boats, lots of activity going on, music, mopeds, scooters, banging, industry. This is the most activity I think we've seen in terms of civilization in a very long time. It's a bit of a shock to the system to be honest. You can see the uh, the mist coming off the mountains after that's so actually that's probably a fire um, we've got this beautiful rainbow look at that after that little squall that we had looks like there could be another one building i just need to open all the windows because it's a bit stuffy down below that was 40 hours of motoring 
not one bit of sailing got the uh, code zero out for 20 seconds speed dropped down to one and a half knots uh, we were fighting a bit of current and uh, there just wasn't enough wind so hopefully we can get a bit more diesel here because this is going to be our last diesel stop before the big one before the big jump Lots of you want to know how we passage plan for a long journey. Uh, Kia on Patreon and Hope Rules on our YouTube community tab both asked about long-term passage planning. Now this is something that Liz has covered off in one of our Q&As in which she outlines how she approached long-term passage planning for our 7,000 nautical mile trip from Thailand to North America. We'll put a link to it in the description. But that's the large scale stuff. What about daily planning? You've just watched us being pursued by a squall and Danny Basso over on Patreon wants to know just how accurate those weather forecasts are. Well, Danny, when we're offline, we use this. This is the Iridium Go. And when it's paired with Predict Wind's weather forecasting system, it's a really useful bit of kit. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about this in a future episode and tell you a bit more about the services that Predict Wind offers. Uh, but you just need to know that they provide different forecasting models. They also provide a way of planning your passage around the weather forecast systems. But, of course, no weather forecasting system is going to tell you when the big squalls are coming because these build in a matter of hours. So when we're online, what we use is RainViewer, and this is an app that simply collates the weather radar information from around the world. So this is real time data, and it will actually show you uh, a snapshot of the last six hours, say, of squalls building. So it will be correct right up to the last minute, and that's really, really useful. But of course, that's when we're online. When we're offline, we're on our own. We just use our eyes. Mm. Brian Johnson on Patreon wants to know uh, what we do in the event of a lightning strike. And Danny Abasso also asked if we start the engine, which we do. Yes, because if you get struck, it's likely to take out your starter motor, which means no engine. The other thing that people do is they use the Faraday cage effect by putting electronic items into either an oven or a microwave. We have neither, so we're stuffed. Yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure whether the Faraday cage effect <laughs> thing works. Because if you get a direct strike by lightning, and right at the moment on social media, there's a little video clip going around of a bike, yeah. uh, of a boat getting a direct li lightning strike. Yeah. You'll see the damage it does. It will take out everything. Yeah. The other thing that we were asked uh, by Brian was, what do you do? Do you strike for home? What do you do? Strike, get it? Strike <laughs> for home? Uh, well, it depends where you are, I suppose. If you get a direct hit and it takes out everything, mm. um, where we were at that point in Sumatra, uh, we'd have to run a dead ship for hundreds of miles. And in fact, yeah. even though we'd crossed the equator, I think I would have been tempted to have turned the boat all the way around and sailed all the way back to Thailand. Because yes. invariably to replace a fully struck uh, boat by lightning, it would mean taking down the masts, rewiring, new electronics. Uh, it's a big job. And there, would, there was nowhere, nowhere no. um, on that side of the world where we could do that. In case you were wondering, that was Millie practicing doing the draw for our FTB mug. It's now done and you can see the result on the YouTube community page, but no one's claimed it yet. So take a look, there's a mug going. Okay, now Kia and Danny on Patreon wanted to know about contingency plans. Yeah. Do we have contingency plans? Well, yes, we do. Uh, unfortunately, in this particular uh, episode, once we'd gone down that East Coast, we'd committed to it. Uh, because there were no anchorages but under normal circumstance what we'll do is we'll scope out every single possible anchorage in advance so that we know where the bolt holes are should anything go wrong at least understand where there's shallower depth where we could drop the hook in an emergency uh, and of course 
because the chart data is often out, we use satellite images as well. Mm. And Nigel Fox on our community tab uh, wondered if we could supplement chart data by using offline maps and satellite imagery. Yeah, and that's exactly what we do. And uh, you probably saw the episode, Nigel, where we talked about all-in-one offline maps app. Uh, people, some people use CAP files, uh, but uh, I think as we said before, sometimes satellite data actually becomes our primary means of navigation. Mm. That eyeballing and the depth sounder. So we're always aware of possible anchorages, uh, both in front of us and behind us, should anything go wrong. By the way, Nigel, I hear you're going to be in Indonesia in the next few weeks. Don't forget to take millions of rupiah with you. <laughs> Okay, Astrid on Patreon uh, says, do you find that the devil you know is preferable over an unknown? Is it better to stay put at a less than ideal spot while waiting for a more favorable window to a destination further away? Good question. Yes, and also um, we're asked a question by Daprez on YouTube community page, which says, each anchorage is so beautiful and amazing. How do you decide when it is truly time to move on? Do you ever feel rushed to keep moving along? Well, I think as we explained in this episode, we were in a rush yeah. and so there was that pressure on us. Um, but we will sit out bad weather if we have to. But you'll see in a very near future episode how we used weather data to actually take advantage of some pretty strong northwesterly winds in order to make up time so and, and to save on diesel as well. So we actually used that weather data to leave a safe anchorage and run with the tail end of some bad weather. But, you know, given the choice, I think we'd prefer to sit out the really shitty weather yeah, and wait definitely. for some much more favourable winds. Mm.